story ten of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story ten matalette's section nice place oh, i guess it is there ain't no such farm in this part of illinois nor anywhere else that i knows on two-story house and painted instead of being whitewashed blinds on the winders no thirty-dollar horses in the barn and no old unpainted wagons round no deadened trees standing around in the corn lot or the wheat field not a one good cribs to hold his corn instead of leaving it on the stock or tugging it away in holler sycamore logs good pump to heist his drinking water with good help to keep up with the work why there ain't a man on matalette's whole place that don't look smart enough to run a farm all alone by himself and money well he don't ask no credit of any man he just hauls out his money and pays up as if he enjoyed getting rid of it there's nobody like him in these parts you can just bet your life the speaker was a southern illinoisan of twenty-five years ago and his only auditor was a brother farmer both worked hard and shook often with ague between the seed time and harvest but neither had succeeded in amassing such comfortable results as had seemed to reward the efforts of their neighbor matalette for the listener had not heard half the story of matalette's advantages he was as good-natured smart and hospitable as he was lucky he indulged in the unusual extravagance of a hired cook and the neighbors though they on principle disapproved of such expenditure never failed to appreciate the results of the said cook's labors matalette had a sideboard too and the contents smelled and tasted very unlike the liquor which was sold at the only store in bonpas bottoms when young lacour who was making a gallant fight against a stumpy quarter section had his only horse lie down and die just as the second corn ploughing season came on it was matalette who supplied the money which bought the new horse when the inhabitants of the bottoms wondered and talked and argued about the advisability of trying some new seed wheat which had the reputation of being very heavy matalette settled the whole question by ordering a large lot and distributing it with his compliments lastly though the statement has not strictly speaking any agricultural bearing matalette had a daughter there were plenty of daughters among the families in bonpas bottoms and many of them were very estimable girls but helen matalette was very different from any of them always knows just what to say and do remarked sile conover one day at the store where the male gossips of the neighborhood met to exchange views a fellow goes up to see matalette goes in his shirt sleeves not expectin to see any women around when who comes to the door but her for a moment a fellow wishes he could fly or sink next minute he feels as if he'd been acquainted with her for a year hanged if i understand it but she's the kind of gal i go in for the latter clause of sile's speech fitly expressed the sentiments of all the young men in bonpas bottoms as well as of many gentlemen not so young old men farmers with daughters of their own would cheerfully forego the delights of either a prayer meeting or a circus and suddenly find some business to transact with matalette whenever there seemed a reasonable chance of seeing helen and some of them as had sons of a marriageable age would express to those young men their entire willingness to be promoted to the rank of fathers-in-law there was just one unpleasant thing about the matalettes both father and daughter and that was the ease with which one could startle them it was rather chilling until one knew matalette well to see him tremble and start violently on being merely slapped on the shoulder by some one whose approach he had not noticed it was equally unpleasant for a newcomer on suddenly confronting helen to see her turn pale and look quickly and furtively about as if preparing to run the editor of the bonpas cornblade in a sonnet addressed to h m compared this action to that of a startled fawn but the public wondered whether helen's father could possibly be excused in like manner and whether the comparison could with propriety be extended so as to include the three hired men who curiously enough were equally timorous at first acquaintance 
but this single fault of the matalettes and their adherents was soon forgotten for it did not require a long residence in bonpas bottoms to make the acquaintance of every person living in that favoured section and strangers except such strangers as occasionally strolled ashore while the steamboat landed supplies for the store or shipped the grain which matalette was continually buying and sending to new orleans seldom found their way to bonpas bottoms the matalettes sat at supper one evening when there was heard a knock on the door there was in an instant an unusual commotion about the table at which sat the three hired men with the host and his daughter a commotion most extraordinary for a land in which neither indians nor burglars were known each of the hired men hastily clicked something under the table while helen turned pale but quickly drew a small stiletto from a fold of her dress ready said matalette in a low tone as he took a candle from the table and placed his unoccupied hand in his pocket yes whispered each of the men while helen nodded who's there shouted matalette approaching the outer door i asbury croon the new circuit preacher replied a voice i'm wet and cold and hungry can you give me shelter in the name of my master certainly cried matalette hastening to open the door while the three hired men rapidly repocketed their pistols and helen gave vent to a sigh of relief they heard a heavy pack thrown on the floor a hearty greeting from matalette and then they saw in the doorway a tall straight young man whose blue eyes heavy closely curling yellow hair and finely cut features made him extremely handsome despite a solemn puritanical look which not even a driving rain and a cold wind had been able to banish from his face there were many worthy young men in the bonpas bottoms but none of them were at all so fine-looking as asbury croon so at least helen seemed to think for she looked at him steadily except when he was looking at her of course croon being a preacher took none but a spiritual interest in young ladies but where a person's face seemed to show forth the owner's whole soul as was the case with helen matalette's a minister of the gospel is certainly justifiable in looking oft and long at it nay is even grossly culpable if he does not regard it with a lively and tender interest such seemed to be the young divine's train of reasoning and his consequent conclusion for from the time he exchanged his dripping clothing for a suit of matalette's own he addressed his conversation almost entirely to helen and helen who very seldom met in the bonpas bottoms gentlemen of taste and intelligence seemed to be spending an unusually agreeable evening if her radiant and expressive countenance might be trusted to tell the truth when the young preacher according to the custom of his class and denomination at that day finally turned the course of conversation toward the one reputed object of his life it was with a sigh which indicated perhaps how earnestly he regretted that the dominion of satan in the world compelled him to withdraw his soul from such pure and unusual delights as had been his during that evening and when after offering a prayer with the family croon followed matalette to a chamber to rest helen bade him good-night with a bright smile which mixed itself up inextricably with his private devotions his thoughts and his plans for forthcoming sermons and seriously curtailed his night's rest in addition in the morning it was found that his clothing was still wet so as it was absolutely necessary that he should go to fulfil an appointment it was arranged that he should retain matalette's clothing and return within a few days for his own then matalette learning that the young man was travelling his circuit on foot insisted on lending him a horse and on giving him money with which to purchase one it was a great sum of money more than his salary for a year amounted to and the young man's feelings almost overcame him as he tried to utter his thanks but just then helen made her first appearance during the morning and from the instant she greeted croon all thoughts of gratitude seemed to escape his mind unless indeed he suddenly determined to express his thanks through a third party 
such a supposition would have been fully warranted by the expressive looks he cast upon helen's handsome face had any member of the flock at mount pisgah station seen these two young people during the moment or two which followed helen's appearance he would have sorrowfully but promptly dismissed from his mind any expectation of hearing the sermon which croon had promised to preach at mount pisgah that morning but the young preacher was of no ordinary human pattern with sorrow yet determination he bade helen good-bye and though as he rode away he frequently turned his head he never stopped his horse down the road through the dense forest he went trying by reading his bible as he rode to get his mind in proper condition for a mighty effort at mount pisgah he wasn't conscious of doing such a thing he could honestly lay his hand on his heart and say he hadn't the slightest intention of doing anything of the kind yet somehow his bible opened at the song of solomon for a moment he read but for a moment only then he shut his lips tightly and deliberately commenced reading the book of psalms he had fairly restored his mind to working shape and was just whispering fervent thanks to the lord when a couple of horsemen galloped up to him as he turned his head to see who they might be he observed that each of them held a pistol in a very threatening manner as he looked however the pistols dropped and one of the riders indulged in a profane expression of disappointment it's madelet's clothes and horse jim he said to his companion but it's the preacher's face and you have been providentially deferred from committing a great crime exclaimed croon with a reproving look mr madelet took me in last night wet cold and footsore this morning i departed refreshed clothed and mounted to rob a man who is so lavish of beg your pardon parson interrupted one of the men but you haven't got the right pig by the ear we're not highwaymen i'm the sheriff of this county and jim's a constable and as for matalette he's a counterfeiter and we're after him croon dropped his bridle rein and his lower jaw as he exclaimed impossible tis eh huh? said the sheriff well we've examined several lots of money he's paid out lately and there isn't a good bill among em croon mechanically put his hands in his pocket and drew forth the money matalette had given him to buy a horse with the sheriff snatched it that's some of his stock said he looking it rapidly over that seems good enough what will become of his poor daughter ejaculated the young preacher with a vacant look what helen queried the sheriff she's the best engraver of counterfeits there is in the whole west dreadful dreadful exclaimed the young preacher putting his hand over his eyes fact replied the sheriff you parsons have got a big job to do for this world's in the right shape and sheriffs and constables ain't needed wish you good luck at it though twill be bad for trade you'll keep mum about this case of course we'll catch em in the act finally then there won't be any danger about not getting a conviction and our reward that's offered by the banks the sheriff and his assistant galloped on to the village they had been approaching when they overtook croon but the young minister did not accompany them although the village toward which they rode was the one in which he was to preach that morning perhaps he needed more time and quietness in which to compose his sermon if this supposition is correct it may account for the fact that the members of the mount pisgah congregation pronounced his sermon that day from the text all is vanity one of his most powerful efforts in fact old mrs reitz who had for time immemorial entertained the probable angels who appeared at mount pisgah in ministerial guise remarked that preacher seemed all tuckered out by that talk tuck his critter and left town for the puddin was done that same evening the sheriff and his deputy with several special assistants rode from mount pisgah toward matalette's section the night was dark rainy and cloudy the horses stumbled over roots and logs in the imperfectly made road the low-hanging branches spitefully cut the faces of the riders and brought several hats to grief and snatched the sheriff's pipe out of his mouth and yet the sheriff seemed in excellent spirits 
to be sure he softly whistled the air of jordan is a hard road to travel which was the popular air twenty-five years ago but there was a merry tone to his whistle he stopped whistling suddenly and remarked to the constable got notice to-day of another new counterfeit five hundred offered for arrest and conviction on that hope we can prove that on madelet's gang we can go out of politics and run handsome farms of our own if things go all right to-night don't know but i give my whole share though to whoever would arrest helen it's a dog's life anyhow this being a sheriff i won't complain however if we get that gang to-night the party rode on until they were within a mile of madelet's section when they reined their horses into the woods dismounted left a man on watch and approached the dwelling on foot reaching the fence the party halted whispered together for a moment and silently surrounded the house in different directions the sheriff removed his boots walked noiselessly toward the house saw that he had a man at each door and window and posted one at the cellar door then the sheriff put on his boots approached the front door and knocked loudly there was no response the light was streaming brightly from one of the windows and the sheriff tried to look in but the thick curtain prevented him he knocked again and louder but still there was no response then he became uneasy he was a brave man when he knew what was to be met but now all sorts of uncomfortable suspicions crossed his mind the rascals might be upstairs waiting for a quiet opportunity to shoot down at him or they might be under the small stoop on which he stood and preparing to fire up at him they might be quietly burning their spurious money upstairs so as to destroy the evidence against them they might be in the cellar burying the plates the sheriff could endure the suspense no longer signalling to him two of his men he with a blow of a stick of wood broke in the window sash as immediately afterward he tore aside the curtain he and his assistants presented pistols and shouted surrender no one was visible and the sheriff only concealed his sheepish feelings by jumping into the room his assistants followed him and they searched the entire house without finding any one they searched the cellar the outhouses and the barn but encountered only the inquiring glances of the horses and cattle then they searched the house anew hoping to find proof of the guilt of madelette and his family but excepting holes in the floor of a vacant room they found nothing which might not be expected in a comfortable home suddenly some one thought of the boats which madelette kept at the mouth of the creek and a detachment headed by the sheriff went hastily down to examine them the boats were gone not even the tiniest canoe or most dilapidated skiff remained it is grievous to relate but truth is truth that the sheriff who was on sundays a sabbath school superintendent now lost his temper and swore frightfully but no boats were conjured up by the sheriff's language nor did his assistants succeed in finding any up the creek so the party returned to the house and resorted to the illegal measure of helping themselves liberally to the contents of matalette's sideboard meanwhile a black mass floating down the wabash about a dozen miles below the bonpas's mouth seemed the cause of some mysterious plunging and splashing in the river finally an aperture appeared in the black mass and the light streamed out then the figure of a man appeared in the aperture and all was dark again as the figure disappeared within the mass three bearded men dressed like immigrants looked up furtively one yellow-haired man stared vacantly and sadly into the fire which illumined the cabin of the little trading boat while helen matalette sprang forward and threw her arms about the figure's neck it's all gone nell said the man presses and plates are where nobody will be likely to find them the wabash won't tell secrets i'm so glad oh so glad cried the girl it's a fortune thrown away said one of the men moodily yes and a bad name too said she with flashing eyes we're beggars for life anyhow growled another of the men nonsense exclaimed matalette nell's right if we're not tracked and caught i'll never be sorry that we sunk the accursed business forever 
and considering our narrow escape and how it happened i don't think we're very gentlemanly to sit here bemoaning our luck mr croon continued matalette crossing to the yellow-haired figure in front of the fire you saved me what can i give you the young preacher recovered himself and replied briefly your soul matalette winced and in a weak voice asked anything else croon looked toward helen helen blushed and looked a little frightened croon blushed too and seemed to be clearing his throat then with a mighty effort he said uh, yes helen the counterfeiter looked at his daughter for an instant and then failed to see her partly because something marred the clearness of his vision just then and partly because croon interpreting the father's silence as consent took possession of the reward he had named and almost hid her from her father's view matalette's section was finally sold for taxes and was never reclaimed but the excitement relating to its former occupants was for years so great that the purchasers of the estate found it worldly wisdom to dispense refreshments on the ground as for croon a few months after the occurrences mentioned above there appeared in the wilds of missouri a young preacher with unusual zeal and a handsome wife and about the same time four men entered a quarter section of prairie land near the young preacher's station and appeared then and evermore to be the most ardent and faithful of the young man's admirers End of story ten. story eleven of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story eleven a story of ten mile gulch one the horse which mr tom ruger rode kept the path steep and rugged though it was without any guidance from him and its mate followed demurely they were accustomed to it and many a mile had they traversed in this way taking turns at carrying their owner and master indeed the trio seemed inseparable and as happy as tom ruger and his horses was a phrase that was very often heard at every mining camp and settlement as for mr tom ruger himself very little was known of him save what had been learned during the two years that he had sojourned among them where he came from never was known nor asked but once by the same person all that could be said of him might be summed up in the following statement the finest looking the best dressed and the best mannered man on the pacific coast and the best horseman these were the words of mine host at the ten mile house and as he was a gentleman whose word was as good as his paper we will accept them as truth as mr ruger rode down the mountainside that beautiful autumn day dressed in the finest of broadcloth with linen of the most immaculate whiteness smoking what appeared to be a very good cigar and humming to himself a fragment of some old song he looked strangely out of place so thought miss fanny borlan as she looked out of the stage window and caught her first glimpse of him just where his path intersected the stage road and she would have asked the driver about him had he not been so near mr ruger caught sight of her face about that time and tossing away the cigar he lifted his hat to her in the most approved style she acknowledged the salute by a bow and when he rode up to the side of the stage and made some casual remark about the fine weather she did not choose to consider it out of the way to receive this advance toward a travelling acquaintance with seeming cordiality have you travelled far he asked from the atlantic coast sir the same journey that i intend to take some of these days only that i hope to substitute the word pacific at its termination i hope you are near the end of your journey in this direction my destination is ten mile gulch i believe but you have such horrid names out here i presume they do appear somewhat queer to a stranger but they nearly all have the merit of being appropriate you stop at the settlement i do not know my brother wrote to me to come to ten mile gulch is it the name of a town both of a village and a mining district from which the village takes its name 
is your brother a minor yes sir i presume he intended to meet you at the settlement you will no doubt find him at the tavern if not i will tell him of your arrival for my way leads through the mines thank you sir my brother's name is john borlan i am somewhat acquainted with him said mr ruger though in this region of strange names we call him jack my name is thomas ruger tom in california style she asked with a merry twinkle in her eye yes miss borlan he said also smiling tom ruger is well known where thomas ruger never was heard of and now i will bid you good day miss borlan for i am in something of a hurry to reach the settlement if i do not find jack there i will go on to the mines and tell him ah miss you don't have such men as tom ruger out where you come from said the driver as tom disappeared up the road and them nags of his can't be beat this side of the mountains he makes a heap of money with em what a horse jockey exclaimed miss borlan we don't call him that miss some says he's a sportin man which ain't nothin agin him for the country's new you see he's got heaps of money anyway and there ain't a camp nor a town on the coast that don't know tom ruger ah you don't have such men as tommy he'd be at home in a palace now wouldn't he and it's just the same in a miner's shanty you don't have such men as he if he takes a likin to anybody he sticks to em through thick and thin but if he gets agin you once he's the very deuce ah you don't have no such man out where you come from she did not care to dispute this point in fact after what she had seen and heard she was inclined to believe that there was no such men as tom rieger out where she had come from so she made no reply and the driver following out his train of thought rattled on about tom ruger until they came in sight of ten mile gulch winding up his narrative with the sage but rather unexpected remark that there weren't no such men as tom ruger out where she had come from two the bar-room at the miner's home might have been more crowded at some former period of its existence but to have duplicated the two dozen faces and forms of the two dozen ten milers who were congregated there that beautiful autumn afternoon would have been a hopeless task ten mile gulch had turned out en masse and those same ten milers were distinguished neither for their good looks nor taste in dress nor softness of heart or language nor elegance of manners further than that we do not care to go at present but there was one face and one form absent no more would the genial atmosphere of that bar-room respond to the heavings of his broad chest no more would the dignified concoctor of rare and villainous drinks pass him the whisky straight alas bill foster had passed in his checks and gone the way of all ten milers and it was this fact that brought these diligent delvers after hidden treasure from their work for bill had not gone in the ordinary way at night he was in the full enjoyment of health and a game of poker in the morning they found him just outside the domicile of jack borlan with a small puncture near the heart to tell how it was done such was life at ten mile gulch who made the puncture circumstances pointed to jack borlan and they escorted him down to the settlement he stood by the bar conversing with a dispenser of liquid lightning two very calm ten milers were within easy reach of mr borlan two more at the door which was left temptingly open two more at each window and the remainder scattered about the room to suit themselves mr bob watson was the only one calm enough to enjoy a seat and he was whittling away at the pine bench with such energy that a stranger might have concluded that whittling was his best hold not so however he whittled until he found a nail with the edge of his knife and then varied his diversion by grasping the point of the blade between the thumb and first finger of his right hand and throwing it at the left eye of a very flattering representation of yankee sullivan which graced the wall by a slight miscalculation of distance and elevation the eye was unharmed but the well-developed nose was more effectually ruined than its original ever was by the most scientific pugilist 
well gentlemen what shall we do with the prisoner asked watson we're waiting for you said a tall ten miler who had been a pleased witness of the knife throwing and its results well you need not retorted mr watson as he made a fling at yankee's other eye and with very good success you know my sentiments gentlemen i was opposed to bringing the prisoner here we might have fixed up the matter all at one time and saved a heap of diggin it might have done said the tall miler doubtfully but i wouldn't like to see the two together it would spoil all my enjoyment of the occasion bet you're ten to one you don't swing em cried watson springing to his feet with sudden inspiration and mounting the bench he had been whittling twenty to one jack borland don't choke this heat who takes me who who no one seemed disposed to take him bosh you ten milers are all babies now if this had happened up at quit claim borland would have had a beautiful tombstone over him long ago what do you say borland the prisoner thus addressed cut short some remark he was making and turned to watson there have been cases where the prisoner had the benefit of a trial mr watson which is so mr borland obliged to you for reminding me let's have one gentlemen i'll be prosecuting attorney if no one objects now who'll defend the prisoner at the bar i'll make a feeble attempt that way was the reply that came from the doorway all eyes turned and recognized tom ruger this is betwixt us ten milers said watson borland is guilty and we're bound to hang him before sundown but we want to do the fair thing and give him the benefit of a trial who of you ten milers will defend him i told you i would defend mr borland said tom ruger as he removed his silk hat and wiped his broad forehead with the finest of silk handkerchiefs i tell you we won't have any outsiders in this game said watson i really dislike to contradict you mr watson replied tom ruger as he very carefully readjusted his hat very sorry mr watson and i do hope you'll pardon me when i repeat that i will defend mr borland with my life this remark surprised no one more than jack borland he had never spoken to mr ruger a dozen times in his life and he could not account for such disinterestedness however there was not much time for conjecture for mr watson had taken offence with your death tom ruger if you interfere cried watson jumping down from his elevation it did look that way but mr ruger had not strolled up and down the auriferous coast without acquiring some knowledge of the usual means of defence in that sunny clime as well as some practice it was quite warm for a moment then mr borland believing it to be his duty as client to aid his counsel in the defence went in gladly still it was quite warm also somewhat smoky from the powder that had been burned likewise noisy not so noisy however that mr borland could not hear his counsel say clear yourself borland my horses are down at the ford mr borland followed the advice of his counsel and mr ruger followed mr borland the ten milers some of them followed both counsel and client it was neck and heels until the horses were reached after that the pursuers were left at a great disadvantage i'll have his heart ejaculated watson which heart he meant we have no means of knowing give me a horse quick they brought a mule wait here every man of you watson shouted back over the shaved tail of his substitute for a horse i'll bring him back dead or alive or my name ain't watson and over the way the stage had stopped and fanny borland had reached ten mile gulch at last three a little after sunrise the next morning mr tom ruger might have been seen leisurely riding along the bridle path between the mines and the settlement of ten mile gulch he was headed toward the village and was nine and three-quarter miles nearer to it than the mines he had found another good cigar somewhere and was humming the self-same tune as on the previous afternoon but the riderless horse was not with him as mr ruger rode into the only street in the village his approach was heralded and the ten milers who were waiting for watson's return filed out of the miners home and took stations in the street 
mr ruger took note of this demonstration and with a very business-like air examined the contents of his holsters he also noticed that patched noses and heads and canes and crutches were the predominating features in the group of ten milers with an occasional closed eye and a bandaged hand to vary the monotony miss fanny borlan from her window at the ten mile house also noticed the dilapidated looks of the frequenters of the miners home and wondered if they kept a hospital there then she saw mr ruger and bowed and smiled as he drew up at her window so you arrived all safe miss borlan how do you like the place better than the inhabitants she answered with a glance over the way than those i mean is it a hospital for the present i believe it is and will be for some time to come if they all stay till they're cured but have you seen jack yes last evening he was very sorry that he could not wait for you but it may be as well however he has gone down to san francisco and he will wait for you there the stage leaves here in about two hours and i advise you to take passage in it if you are not too much fatigued oh i'm not tired a bit mr ruger i will go back thank you for the trouble you have taken no trouble miss borlan give my respects to jack and tell him i will be down in a week or two good morning while talking mr ruger had about evenly divided his glances between the very beautiful face of fanny borlan and the somewhat expressive countenances of the ten milers not that he found anything to admire in their damaged physiognomies but he never wholly ignored the presence of any one good morning gentlemen he said as he rode up in front of them not to you tom ruger spoke a tall ten miler the only one by the way who had come out of the previous day's trial unscathed not to you tom ruger where's borlan he's gone down the coast on business said ruger and may not be back for several months we'll not wait for him was the miner's reply at the same time he drew a revolver you had better wait said ruger also producing a revolver the ten miler paused and looked around at his companions they did not present a formidable array of fighting stock in fact they were the sorest looking men that ten mile gulch ever saw and as the unscathed surveyed them he seemed to think he had better wait you'll wait for mr borlan queried ruger i reckon we'd better answered the unscathed and while you are waiting you had better take a cursory glance at mr watson suggested ruger at the present time he is reposing in the shade of an acacia bush just back of the late lamented william foster's rural habitation good morning gentlemen and don't get impatient if mr ruger had any fear of treachery he did not exhibit it for he never turned his head as he rode off toward the valley nor was there any danger for beneath his suggestion about mr watson the unscathed had detected a thing or two i'm glad we waited he said i begin to see a thing or two them as is able will follow me up the gulch about half a score went with him mr watson was still enjoying the shade of the acacia bush in fact he couldn't get away which mr ruger well knew it's all up with me gulchers whispered watson ruger was too many for me and i ought to have known it you'll find bill foster's dust in a flour sack in my cabin my respects to borlan when you see him and tell him i beg his pardon for discommoding him give what dust is honestly mine to him it's all i can do now good-bye boys and just played out but take my advice and never buck against tom ruger he's too many for any dozen chaps on the coast i knew twas all up with me the minute tom came in for he can look right through a feller's heart but never mind it's too late to help it now i staked everything i had against foster's pile and i'm beat 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 these were the last words mr bob watson ever spoke as many a surviving ten miler will tell you and they buried him in the spot where he died without any beautiful stone to mark the place four miss fanny borlan found jack awaiting her in san francisco what made you run away why fanny didn't tom tell you about it queried jack tom oh you mean mr ruger 
he only sent me down here just like him fan very few words he ever wastes ah sister we don't have such men out east so the stage driver told me said fanny demurely there fan you're poking fun now wait till i get through only for tom you would have found me at ten mile gulch hanging by the neck to the limb of that tree just in front of the home hanging jack hanging fan lynched for a murder i never committed tom came along just in the nick of time and well fan perhaps you saw some of the ten milers before you came away yes jack and there was only one whole nose in the lot and i do believe that was out of joint but oh jack if they had taken your life never mind now sis tom was too many for em and here i am safe we'll wait here till tom comes down for i've got one of his horses which he thinks more of than he does of himself then for home sis mr tom ruger went down as he said he would and remained with them several days on the morning that they were to sail fanny said to tom i wish you were going with us mr ruger we shall miss you very much won't you go mr ruger was talking with jack at the time but he heard fanny he always heard what she said he did not reply at once however but said to jack in a low tone jack you know what i have been can i ever become worthy of her and jack answered promptly god bless you tom you are worthy now thank you jack if you believe then he went over to fanny i will go was all he said it was a great wonder to both jack and his sister how tom could have got ready for the journey on so short a notice but one day more than a year afterward tom said to jack old friend i'm not what i was i hope ever since i first saw fanny on the road to ten mile gulch i have tried to live differently i hope i am better for she said last night that she would take me for better or worse and jack wondered no more end of story eleven Story twelve of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story twelve Captain Sam's Change. Well, there's nothing to do but to have faith and keep a tryin'. The speaker was old Mrs. Simmons, boarding house keeper, and resident of a certain town on the Ohio River the prime cause of her remark was Captain Sam Topey of the steamship Queen Anne captain sam had stopped with mrs simmons every time the queen anne laid up for repairs and he was so genial frank and manly that he had found a warm spot in the good old lady's heart but one thing marred the otherwise perfect happiness of mrs simmons when in captain sam's society and that was what she styled his lost condition for mrs simmons was a consistent conscientious methodist while captain sam was well he was a western steamboat captain this useful class of gentlemen are in high repute among shippers and barkeepers and receive many handsome compliments from the daily papers along the line of the western rivers but somehow the religious press is entirely silent about them nor have we ever seen of any special mission having been sent to them captain sam was a good specimen of the fraternity good-looking good-natured quick-witted prompt and faithful as well as quick-tempered profane and perpetually thirsty to carry a full load put his boat through in time and always drink up to his peg were his cardinal principles and he faithfully lived up to them of the fair sex he was a most devoted admirer and if he had not possessed a great deal of modesty for a steamboat captain he could have named two or three score of young women who thought almost as much of him as the worthy boarding-house keeper did good mrs simmons had to use her own language carried him before the lord and wrestled for him but it was very evident from sam's walk and conversation that his case had not yet been adjudicated according to mrs simmons liking he still had occasional difficulties with the hat-stand and stairway after coming home late at night 
his breath though generally odorous seemed to grieve mrs simmons olfactories and his conversation as heard through his open door in summer was thickly seasoned with expressions far more scriptural than reverential one christmas the old lady presented to the captain a handsome bible with his name stamped in large gilt letters on the cover he was so delighted and so proud of his present that he straightway wrapped it in many folds of paper to prevent its being soiled and then stowed it neatly away in the queen anne's safe for secure keeping when he told mrs simmons what he had done she sighed deeply but fully alive to the importance of the case promised him a common one not too good to read daily daily bless you mrs simmons why i hardly have time to look at the paper and see who's gone up and who's gone down and who's been beat but your better part captain pleaded the old lady i don't know my good woman hard to find it i guess the whole lot averages pretty low but captain she continued don't you feel your need of a change not from the queen anne ma'am she only needs bigger engines change a heart i mean captain interrupted mrs simmons don't you feel your need of religion ah roared captain sam the idea of a steamboat captain with religion why bless your dear innocent old soul the first time he wanted to wood up in a hurry his religion would git quicker'n lightnin the only steamboat man i ever knowed in the meetin house line went up for seven year for settin fire to his own boat to get the insurance mrs simmons could not recall at the moment the remembrance of any pious captain so she ceased labouring with captain sam but when he went out she placed on his table a tract entitled the furnace seven times heated which tract the captain considerately handed to his engineer supposing it to be a circular on intensified caloric year after year the captain laid up for repairs and put up with mrs simmons year after year he was jolly genial chivalrous generous but not what good mrs simmons earnestly wanted him to be he would buy tickets to all the church fairs give free passages to all preachers recommended by mrs simmons and on sunday morning he would respectfully escort the old lady as far as the church door on one occasion when mrs simmons church building was struck by lightning a deacon dropped in with a subscription paper while the captain was in the generous steamboatman immediately put himself down for fifty dollars and although he improved the occasion to condemn severely the meanness of certain holy people and though his language seemed to create an atmosphere which must certainly melt the money for those were specie days mrs simmons declared to herself that he couldn't be fur from the kingdom when his heart was so little set on mammon as that he's too good for satan the lord must have him thought the good old lady once again the queen anne needed repairing and again the captain found himself at his old boarding-place good mrs simmons surveyed him tenderly through her glasses and instantly saw there had something unusual happened could it be oh if it only could be that he had put off the old man which is sin she longed to ask him yet with a woman's natural delicacy she determined to find out without direct questioning good season cap'n she inquired a number one ma'am positively first class replied the captain had good health no eager she continued never was better my good woman healthy right up to the top knot he answered it must be said good mrs simmons to herself it can't be nothing else bless the lord this pious sentiment she followed up by a hymn whose irregularities of time and tune were fully atoned for by the spirit with which she sung a knock at the door interrupted her come in she cried captain sam entered and laid a good-sized flat flask on the table saying i've just been unpacking and i found this perhaps you can use it for cookin it's no use to me i've sworn off drinkin and before the astonished lady could say a word he was gone but the good soul could endure the suspense no longer she hurried to the door and cried cap'n that's me answered captain sam returning 
cap'n said mrs simmons in a voice in which solemnity and excitement struggled for the mastery has the lord sent his angel unto you he has replied the captain in a very decided tone and abruptly turned and hurried to his own room bless the lord o oh my soul almost shouted mrs simmons in her ecstasy we mustn't worry them that's weak in the faith but i shan't be satisfied till i hear him tell his experience oh what a blessed thing to relate at prayer meeting to-night there was indeed a rattling of dry bones at the prayer meeting that night for it was the first time in the history of the church that the conversion of a steamboat captain had been reported on returning home from the meeting additional proof awaited the happy old saint the captain was in his room in his room at nine o'clock in the evening she had known the captain for years but he had never before got in so early there could be no doubt about it though there he was softly whistling i'd rather hear him whistling wyndham or boylston thought mrs simmons that tune don't fit any hymn i know perhaps though they sing it in some of them churches up to cincinnati she charitably continued cap'n said she at breakfast next morning when the other guests had departed is your mind at peace peace echoed the captain peaceful as the ohio at low water the captain's simile was not so scriptural as the old lady could have desired but she remembered that he was but a young convert and that holy conversation was a matter of gradual attainment so simply and piously making the best of it she fervently exclaimed that it may ever be thus is my earnest prayer cap'n amen to that said cap'n sam very heartily upsetting the chair in his haste to get out of the room for several days mrs simmons lived in a state of bliss unknown to boarding-house keepers whose joys come only from a sense of provisions purchased cheaply and paying boarders secured from the kitchen the dining-room or wherever she was issued sounds of praise and devotion intoned to some familiar church melody scrubbing the kitchen floor dampened not her ardour and even the fateful washing-day produced no visible effects on her spirits from over the bread-pan she sent exultant strains to echo through the house and her fists vigorously marked time in the yielding dough from the third-story window as she hung out the bed-linen to air her holy notes fell on the ears of passing teamsters and caused them to cast wondering glances upwards what was the heat of the kitchen stove to her now that captain sam was insured against flames eternal what now was even money since captain sam had laid up his treasure above and the captain's presence which had always comforted her was now a perpetual blessing always pleasant kind and courteous as of old but oh so different all the coal scuttles and water pails in the house might occupy the stairway at night but the captain could safely thread his way among them no longer did she hurry past his door with her fingers ready at the slightest alarm to act as compressors to her ears no the captain's language though not exactly religious was eminently proper he was at home so much evenings that his lamp consumed more oil in a week than it used to in months but the old lady cheerfully refilled it and complained not that the captain's goodness was costly the captain brought home a book or two daily and left them in his room seeing which his self-denying hostess carried up the two flights of stairs her own copies of clark's commentaries the saint's best joy's exercises and morning and night watches and arranged them neatly on his table finally after a few days captain sam seemed to have something to say something which his usual power of speech was scarcely equal to mrs simmons gave him every opportunity at last when he ejaculated mrs simmons just as she was carrying her beloved glass preserve dish to its place in the parlor closet she was so excited that she dropped the brittle treasure and uttered not a moan over the fragments mrs simmons i've made up my mind to lead an entirely new life said the captain gravely 
it's what i've been hopin for years and years cap'n responded the happy old lady have you though god bless your motherly old soul said the captain warmly well i've turned over a new leaf and it don't get turned back again that's right said mrs simmons with a happy tear under each spectacle glass fight the good fight cap'n just my little game continued the captain tain't every day that a man can find an angel willin to look out for him mrs simmons an angel oh cap'n how richly blessed you have been sobbed mrs simmons many's the one that has prayed all their lives long for the comin of a good spirit to guide em well i've got one sure pop continued captain sam and happy ain't any kind of a name for what i be all the time now bless you said the good woman wringing the captain's hand fervently but you'll have times of trouble and doubt off and on is that so asked the captain thoughtfully yes continued mrs simmons but don't be afeard everything will come right in the end i know i've been through it all that's so said the captain you have that well now would you mind introducing me to your minister mind said the good old lady i've been a-dying to do it ever since you come i've told him about it and he's as glad for you as i am oh said the captain looking a little confused you suspected it did you from the very minute you first come replied mrs simmons i know the signs well said the captain might as well see him first as last then i reckon i'll get ready right away said mrs simmons and away she hurried leaving the captain greatly puzzled the old lady put on her newest bombazine dress all this happened ten years ago ladies and a hat to match never before had these articles of dress been seen by the irreligious light of a weekday the day seemed fully as holy as an ordinary sabbath they attracted considerable attention in their good clothes and solemn faces and finally as they stood on the parson's doorstep two of the captain's own deckhands saw him and straightway drank themselves into a state of beastly intoxication in trying to decide what the captain could want of a preacher the minister entered cordially greeted mrs simmons and expressed his pleasure at forming the captain's acquaintance parson said the captain in trembling accents don't go away mrs simmons parson my good friend here tells me you know all about my case now the question is how soon can you do the business the reverend gentleman shivered a little at hearing the word business applied to holy things but replied in excellent temper the next opportunity will occur on the first sabbath of the coming month and i shall be truly delighted to gather into our fold one whose many worthy qualities have been made known to us by our dearly beloved sister simmons and let me further remind you that there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth and that therefore oh just so parson interrupted the captain wincing a little and looking exceedingly puzzled just uh, so but ain't there no day but sunday for a man to be married married ejaculated the minister looking inquiringly at mrs simmons married screamed the old lady staring wildly at the captain married oh what shall i do i thought you'd experienced a change and i've told everybody about it the captain burst into a laugh which made the minister's chandeliers rattle and the holy man himself seeing through the mistake heartily joined the captain but poor mrs simmons burst into an agony of tears my dear good old friend said the captain tenderly putting his arm about her i'm very sorry you have been disappointed but one thing at a time you know when you see my angel you'll think i'm in a fair way to be an angel myself some day i guess annie's her name annie may and i've named the boat after her don't take on so and i'll show you the old boat new painted and the name annie may stuck on wherever there's a chance but the good old woman only wrung her hands and exclaimed thar's a lovely experience completely spiled completely spiled at length she was quieted and escorted home and a few days afterward appeared in smiles and the new bombazine at the captain's wedding 
the bride a motherless girl speedily adopted mrs simmons as mother and made many happy hours for the old lady but that venerable and pious person is frequently heard to say to herself in periods of thoughtfulness a lovely experience completely spiled end of story twelve Story thirteen of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story thirteen Miss Fune's Last Conquest. How many conquests Mabel Fune had made since she had entered society, no one was able to tell. Perhaps the conqueror herself kept some record of the havoc she had worked, but if she did, no one but herself ever saw it even such of her rivals as were envious admitted that miss fune's victims could be counted by dozens while the men who came under the influence of that charming young lady were wont to compute their fellow sufferers by the hundred it mattered not where miss fune spent her time whether she enjoyed the season in new york or washington baltimore or boston she found that climatic surroundings did not in the least change the conduct of men toward her in what her attractions especially consisted her critics and admirers were not all agreed pallet the artist who was among her earliest conquests said she was the embodiment of all ideal harmonies while old coupon who at sixty offered her himself and his property declared in confidence to another unfortunate that what took him was her solid sense at least one young man who thought himself a poet fell in love with her for what he called the golden foam of her hair a theological student went into pious ecstasy and subsequent dejection over the spiritual light of her eyes the habitual pose of her pretty fingers accounted for the awkward attentions of at least a score of young men and the piquancy of her manner attracted to their certain detriment all the professional beaux who met her and yet a clear-headed literary bostonian declared that she was better read than some of his distinguished confreres while a member of congress excused himself for monopolizing her for an entire half-hour at an evening party by saying that miss fune talked politics so sensibly that for the first time in his life he had learned how much he himself knew as for the ladies some said any one could get as much admiration as mabel fune if they could dress as expensively others said she was so skilful a flirt that no man could see through her wily ways two or three inclined to the theory of personal magnetism while a few brave women said that mabel was so pretty and tasteful and modest and sensible and sweet that men would be idiots if they didn't fall in love with her at sight but one season came in which those who envied and feared mabel were left in peace for that young lady determined to spend the winter with her sister who was the wife of a military officer stationed at smithton in the far west smithton was a small town but a pleasant one it had a railroad and mines a government land office was established there as was the state government also trading was incessant money was plenty so men of wit and culture came there to pay their respects to the almighty dollar and as there were nearly two score of refined ladies in the town society was delightful to the fullest extent of its existence and mabel fune enjoyed it intensely the change of air and of scene gave stimulus to her spirits and new grace to her form and features so that she soon had at her feet all the unmarried men in smithton while many sober benedicts admired as much as they could safely do without transferring their allegiance smithton was not inhabited exclusively by people of energy and culture new settlements like all other things new powerfully attract incapables and smithton was no excuse to the rule in one portion of it eclept the end were gathered many characters more odd than interesting their local habitations seemed to be the liquor shops which fairly filled that portion of the town about the doors of these shops the enders were most frequently seen 
if one of them chanced to stray into the business street of the town he seemed as greatly confused and troubled as a lost boy in his own quarter however and among his own kind the ender displayed a composure which was simply superb no one could pass through the end by daylight without seeing many of the inhabitants thereof leaning against fences trees buildings and such other objects as could sustain without assistance the weight of the human frame from these points of support the enders would contemplate whatever was transpiring about them with that immobility of countenance which characterizes the finished tourist and the north american indian there were occasions when these self-possessed beings assumed erect positions and manifested ordinary human interest one of these was the breaking out of a fight between either men or animals another was the passing of a lady of either handsome face or showy dress so it happened that when pretty well-dressed mabel fune was enjoying a drive with one of her admirers there was quite a stir among such enders as chanced to see her the vendors of the beverages for which the enders spent most of their money noticed that upon that particular afternoon an unusual proportion of their customers stood at the bar with no assistance from the bar itself that some spirit was manifest in their walk and conversation and yet they were less than usual inclined to be quarrelsome so great was the excitement caused by miss fune's appearance that one ender was heard to ask another who she was an exhibition of curiosity very unusual in that part of the town even more one member of that apparently hopeless gang was known to wash his face and hands purchase a suit of cheap but new and clean clothing and take an eastern-bound train presumably to appear among respectable people he had known during some earlier period of his existence on the evening of the next day a delightful little party was enjoyed by the well-to-do inhabitants of smithton new as was the town the parlors of mrs general wader her husband was something for the railway company were handsomely furnished the ladies were elaborately dressed the gentleman lacked not one of the funereal garments which men elsewhere wear to evening parties and stupid people were noticeably rarer than in similar social gatherings in older communities mabel fune was there and as human nature is the same at smithton as in the east she was the belle of the evening she entered the room on the arm of her brother-in-law and that warrior's height breadth bronzed countenance and severe uniform made all the more striking the figure which clad apparently in a pale blue cloud edged with silver and crowned with gold floated beside him men crowded about her at once and the other ladies present had almost undisturbed opportunity in which to converse with each other at the end there was likewise a social gathering the place was drake's saloon and the guests were self-invited their toilettes though unusual scarcely required description and a list of their diversions would not interest people of taste refreshments were as plentiful as at mrs wader's and after the manner of refreshments everywhere they caused a general unbending of spirits not all the effects were pleasing to contemplate one of them was a pistol shot which missing the man for whom it was intended struck a person called bags and remarkable only for general worthlessness bags had a physical system of the conventional type however and the bullet caused some disarrangement so radical in its nature that bags was soon stretched upon the floor of the saloon with a face much whiter than he usually wore the barkeeper poured out a glass of brandy and passed it over the bar but the wounded man declined it he also rejected a box of pills which was proffered an ender who claimed to have been a physician stooped over the victim felt its pulse and remarked bags you're a goner i know it said bags and i want to be prayed for the barkeeper looked puzzled he was a public-spirited man whose heart and pocket were open to people in real trouble but for prayers he had never been asked before and was entirely destitute of them 
he felt relieved when one of his customers a leaden-visaged man with bulbous nose and a bad temper advanced toward the wounded man raised one hand threw his head back a trifle and exclaimed once in grace always in grace i've been there i know let us pray the victim waved his hand impatiently and faintly exclaimed you won't do somebody that's better acquainted with god than you are must do it but bags reasoned the barkeeper perhaps he's been a preacher you'd better not throw away a chance don't care if he has whispered bags it don't look like any of the praying people mother used to know the would-be petitioner took his rebuff considerably to heart and began in a low and rapid voice an argument with himself upon the duration of the state of grace the enders listened but indifferently however the dying man was more interesting to them than living questions for he had no capacity for annoyance the barkeeper scratched his head and pinched his brow but gaining no idea thereby he asked do you know the right man bags not here i don't gasped the sufferer not the right man the emphasis on the last word was not unheeded by the bystanders they looked at each other with as much astonishment as enders were capable of displaying and thrust their hands deep into the pockets of their pantaloons in token of their inability to handle the case bags spoke again i wish mother was here he said she'd know just to say and how to say it she's too far away leastways i s'pose she is said the barkeeper i know it whispered the wounded man and yet a woman bags looked inquiringly appealingly about him but seemed unable to finish his sentence his glance finally rested upon brownie a man as characteristic as himself but at times displaying rather more heart than was common among enders brownie obeyed the summons and stooped beside bags the bystanders noticed that there followed some whispering at times shamefaced and then in the agony of earnestness on the part of bags and replied to by brownie with averted face and eyes gazing into nowhere finally brownie arose with an unender like decision and left the saloon no one else said much but there seemed to circulate an impression that bags was consuming more time than was customary at the end very different was the scene in mrs waiter's parlor instead of a dying man surrounded by uncouth beings there stood a beautiful woman radiant with health and animation while about her stood a throng of well-dressed gentlemen some of them handsome all of them smart and each one craving a smile a word or a look suddenly the pompous voice of general waiter arose most astonishing thing i ever heard of said he an ender has the impudence to ask to see miss fune an ender exclaimed the lady her pretty lips parting with surprise yes and he declares you could not have the heart to say no if you knew his story is it possible miss fune asked one admirer that your cruelty can have driven any one to have become an ender mabel's eyes seemed to glance inward and she made no reply she honestly believed she had never knowingly encouraged a man to become her victim yet she had heard of men doing very silly things when they thought themselves disappointed in love she cast a look of timid inquiry at her host oh perfectly safe if you like said the general the fellow is at the door and several of our guests are in the hall miss fune looked serious and hurried to the door she saw a man in shabby clothing and with unkempt beard and hair yet with a not unpleasing expression madam said he i'm a loafer and i've been a gentleman and i know better than to intrude without a good cause the cause is a dying man he's as rough and worthless as i am but all the roughness has gone out of him just now and he's thinking about his mother and a sweetheart he used to have he wants some one to pray for him some one as unlike himself and his associates as possible he cried for his mother then he whispered to me that he had seen here in smithton a lady that looked like an angel seen her driving only to-day he meant you he isn't pretty 
but when a dying man says a lady is an angel he means what he says two or three moments later miss fune with a very pale face and with her brother-in-law as escort was following brownie the door of the saloon was thrown open and when the enders saw who was following brownie they cowered and fell back as if a sheriff with his posse had appeared the lady looked quickly about her until her eye rested upon the figure of the wounded man him she approached and as she looked down her lip began to tremble i didn't mean it whispered baggs self-depreciation and pain striving for the possession of his face if i hadn't been a-goin i shouldn't have thought of such a thing but dyin takes away one's regular senses it's not my fault ma'am but when i thought about what mother used to say about heaven you came into my mind i felt as if i was insultin you just by thinkin about you a feller such as me to be thinkin about such a lady i tried to see mother and liz my sweetheart that was just as i've seen em when my eyes was shut but i couldn't see nothin but you the way you looked goin along that road and makin the inn look bright i'd shoot myself for the impertinence of the thing if i was goin to get well again but i ain't there needs to be a word said for me by somebody somebody that don't chaw nor drink nor swear somebody that'll catch god's eye if he happens to be looking down and i never saw that kind of a person in smithton till to-day mabel stood speechless with a tear in each eye don't if you don't think best continued baggs i'd rather go to t'other place than bother a lady don't, don't speak a word if you don't want to but maybe you'll think the least thing god can't refuse you but if you think t'other place is best for me all right the fright the sense of strangeness were slowly departing from mabel and as she recovered herself her heart seemed to come into her face and eyes everybody about here is rough or dirty or mean or rich or proud or something continued the dying man in a thin yet earnest voice it's all as good as i deserve but my heart's ached sometimes to look at somebody that will keep me from believing that everything was black and awful and i seen her can i just touch my finger to your dress i've heard mother read how that somebody in the old country was once made all right by just touching the clothes christ had on in his earnestness the wretched man had raised himself upon one elbow and out of his face had departed every expression but one of pitiful pleading still mabel could not speak but bending slightly forward she extended one of her slender dainty hands toward the one which baggs had raised in his appeal white shining good all right he murmured then all of bags which fell back upon the floor was clay with the prudence of a conqueror who knows when the full extent of his powers has been reached mabel fune married within six months the happy man was not a new conquest but an old victim who was wilfully pardoned with such skill that he never doubted that his acceptance to favour was the result of the renewal of his homage End of story 13。story 14 of a romance of California life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 14 Markson's House. Rains is my name, Joseph Rains. I am a house builder by profession and as i do not often see my writings in print except as prepaid advertisements i consider this a good opportunity to say to the public in general that i can build as good a house for a given sum of money as any other builder and that i am a square man to deal with i am aware of the fact that both of these assertions have been made by many other persons about themselves but to prove their trustworthiness when uttered by me the public needs only to give me a trial in justice to other builders i must admit they can use even this last statement of mine with perfect safety for the present and with prospective profit if they get a contract to build a house 
i suppose it will be considered very presumptuous in me to attempt to write a story for while some professions seem relatives of literature i freely admit that there is no carpenter's tool which prepares one to handle a pen to be sure i have read some stories which it seemed to me could have been improved by the judicious use of a handsaw had that extremely radical tool been able to work aesthetically as it does practically and while i have read certain other stories and essays and poems i have been tormented by an intense desire to apply to them a smoothing plane a pair of compasses or a square or even to so far interfere with their arrangement as to cut a window hole or two and an occasional ventilator still admitting that the carpenter should stick to his bench or to his office or carriage if he is a master builder as i am i must yet insist that there are occasions when a man is absolutely compelled to handle tools to which he is not accustomed dr buzzle my own revered pastor established this principle firmly in my mind one day by means of a mild rebuke administered on the occasion of my volunteering to repair some old chairs which had come down to him through several generations the doctor was at work upon them himself and although he seemed to regard the very chips and sawdust even such as found a way into his eyes with reverent affection he was certainly ruining good material in a shocking manner but when i proffered my assistance he replied thank you joseph but they wouldn't be the same chairs if any one else touched them i feel similarly about the matter of my story perhaps you will understand why as you read it when i had finished my apprenticeship people seemed to like me and some of our principal men advised me to stay at bartley my native village it was so near the city they said and would soon fill up with city people who would want villas and cottages built so i stayed and between small jobs of repairing and contracts to build fences stables and carriage houses i managed to keep myself busy and to save a little money after i had paid my bills one day it was understood that a gentleman from the city had bought a villa site overlooking the town and intended to build very soon i immediately wrote him a note saying i would be glad to see his plans and make an estimate and in the course of time the plans were sent me and i am happy to say that i underestimated every one even my own old employer then the gentleman markson his name was drove out to see me and he put me through a severe course of questions until i wondered if he was not some distinguished architect but he wasn't he was a shipping merchant it's certainly astonishing how smart some of those city fellows are about everything the upshot was he gave me the contract and a very pretty one it was ten thousand three hundred and forty dollars to be sure he made me alter the specifications so that the sill should be of stuff ten inches square instead of the thin stuff we usually use for the sills of balloon frame houses such as his was to be and though the alteration would add quite a few dollars to the cost of materials i did not dare to add a cent to my estimate for fear of losing the contract besides though of course i did not intend to do so dishonourable a thing i knew that i could easily make up the difference by using cheap paint instead of good english lead for priming or in either one of a dozen other ways builders have such tricks just as ministers and manufacturers and railroad men do i felt considerably stuck up at getting markson's house to build and my friend said i had a perfect right to feel so for no house so costly had been built at bartley for several years so anxious were my friends that i should make a first-class job of it that they all dropped in to discuss the plan with me and to give me some advice until thanks to their thoughtful kindness my head would have been in a muddle had the contemplated structure been a cheap barn instead of a costly villa but by a careful review of the original plan every night after my friends departed and a thoughtful study of it each morning before going to work i succeeded in completing it according to the ideas of the only two persons really concerned i refer to mr markson and myself 
admitting in advance that there is in the house-building business very little that teaches a man to be a literary critic i must nevertheless say that many poets of ancient and modern times might have found the building of a house a far more inspiring theme than some upon which they have written and even a more respectable one than certain others which some distinguished rhymers have unfortunately selected i have always wondered why after mr longfellow wrote the building of a ship some one did not exercise his muse upon a house i never attempted poetry myself except upon my first baby and even those verses i transcribed with my left hand so they might not betray me to the editor of the bartley conservator to whom i sent them and by whom they were published i say i never attempted poetry writing save once but sometimes when i am working on a house and think of all that must transpire within it of the precious ones who will escape no matter how strongly i build the walls of the destroyer who will get in in spite of the improved locks i put on all my houses of the darkness which cannot at times be dispelled no matter how large the windows nor how perfect the glass may be i am very particular about the glass i put in of the occasional joys which seem meet for heavenly mansions not built by contract of the unseen heroisms greater than any that men have ever cheered and the conquests in comparison with which the achievements of mighty kings are only as splintery hemlock to georgia pine when i think of all this i am so lifted above all that is prosaic and matter-of-fact that i am likely even to forget that i am working by contract instead of by the day besides markson's house was my first job on a residence and it was a large one and i was young and full of what i fancied were original ideas of taste and effect and as i was unmarried and without any special lady friend i was completely absorbed in markson's house how it would look when it was finished what views it would command whether its architectural style was not rather subdued considering the picturesque old hemlocks which stood near by what particular shade of colour would be effective alike to the distant observer and to those who stood close by when the light reached it only through the green of the hemlock just what colour and blending of slate to select so the steep pitched roof should not impart a sombre effect to the whole house how much money i would make on it for this is a matter of utter uncertainty until your work is done and you know what you've paid out and what you get whether markson could influence his friends in my favour what sort of a family he had and whether they were worthy of the extra pains i was taking on their house these and a thousand other wonderings and reveries kept possession of my mind while the natural pride and hope and confidence of a young man turned to sweet music the sound of saw and hammer and trowel and even translated the rustling of pine shavings with hopeful whispers the foundations had been laid and the sills placed in position and i was expecting to go on with the work as soon as markson himself had inspected the sills this he said he wished to do before anything further was done and so that he might not have any fault to find with them i had them sawn to order and made half an inch larger each way so they couldn't possibly shrink before he could measure them the night before he was to come up and examine them i was struck at the supper-table by the idea that perhaps from one of the western chamber windows there might be seen the river which lay between the hills a couple of miles beyond as the moon was up and full i could not rest until i had ascertained whether i was right or wrong so i put a twenty-foot tape-line in my pocket and hurried off to the hill where the house was to stand foundation three feet height of parlor ceilings twelve feet allow for floors two feet more made the chamber floor seventeen feet above the level of the ground climbing one of the hemlocks which i thought must be in line with the river and the window i dropped my line until i had unrolled seventeen feet and then ascended until the end of the line just touched the ground 
i found i was right in my supposition and in the clear mellow light of the moon the river the hills and valleys woods fields orchards houses and rocks the latter ugly enough by daylight and utterly useless for building purposes made a picture which set me thinking of a great many exquisite things entirely out of the house-building line i might have stared till the moon went down for when i've nothing else to do i dearly enjoy dreaming with my eyes open but i heard a rustling in the leaves a little way off and then i heard footsteps and then looking downward i saw a man coming up the path and stop under the tree in which i was of course i wondered what he wanted i should have done so even if i had no business there myself but under the circumstances i became very much excited who could it be perhaps some rival builder come to take revenge by setting my lumber afire i would go down and reason with him but wait a moment if he has come for that purpose he may make things uncomfortable for me before i reach the ground and if he sets the lumber afire and it catches the tree i am in as it certainly will do i will be there is no knowing what sort of a quandary i might not have got into if the man had not stepped out into the moonlight and up on the sills and shown himself to be mr markson well i thought you are the most particular man i ever knew and the most anxious i don't know though it's natural enough if i can't keep away from this house it's not strange that he should want to see all of it he can it's natural enough and it does him credit but mr markson's next action was neither natural nor to his credit he took off his travelling shawl and disclosed a carpenter's brace this and the shawl he laid on the ground and then he examined the sills at the corners where they were joined they were only half joined as we say in the trade that is the ends of each piece of timber were sawn half through and the partially detached portions cut out so that the ends lapped over each other well mr markson hastily stacked up bricks and boards to the height of the foundation and then made a similar stack at the other end of the foundation wall and then he rolled one of the sills over on these two supports so it was bottom side up then he fitted a bit a good wide one an inch and a quarter at least i should say to the brace and then commenced boring a hole in the sill i was astonished but not too much so to be angry that piece of timber was mine mr markson had not paid me a cent yet and was not to do so until the next morning after examining the foundations and sills i had heard of such tricks before my old employer had had men secretly injure a building so as to claim it was not built according to contract when the money came due but none of them did it so early in the course of the business within a few seconds my opinion of mr markson's smartness altered greatly and so did my opinion of human nature in general i would have sadly but promptly sold out my contract with mr markson for the price of a ticket for the west and i should have taken the first train as he bored that hole i could see just how all the other builders in town would look when i had to take the law on markson and how all my friends would come and tell me i ought to have insisted on a payment in advance but after several sorrowful moments had elapsed i commenced to think and i soon made up my mind what i would do i would not descend from the tree while he was there i have too much respect for my person to put it at the mercy of an ill-disposed individual but as soon as he left the place i would hasten to the ground and follow him and demand an explanation he might be armed but i was too there were hard characters at bartley and they knew my pocket-book was sometimes full hole after hole that man bored he made one join another until he had a string of them ten inches long or thereabouts then he began another string right beside the first and then another i saw that his bit went but six or seven inches deep so that it did not pierce the sill and i could almost believe him in league with some rival builder to ruin my reputation by turning over next morning a log apparently sound and showing it to be full of holes 
i didn't feel any better natured either when i noticed that he had carefully put a newspaper under where he was boring to catch all the chips and destroy any idea of the mischief having been done wilfully and on the spot but i determined i would follow him and secure that paper of chips as evidence suddenly he stopped boring and took a chisel from somewhere about his clothes and he soon chiselled that honeycombed spot into a single hole about five inches by ten and six or seven inches deep it slowly dawned over me that perhaps his purpose wasn't malicious after all and by the time i had reasoned the matter he helped me to a conclusion by taking from his pocket a little flat package which he put into the hole it looked as if it might be papers or something the size of folded papers but it was wrapped in something yellow and shiny oilskin probably to keep it from the damp then he drove a few little nails inside the holes to keep the package from falling out when the sill was turned over and then he did something which i never saw mixed with carpenter work in my life he stooped and kissed the package as it lay in the hole and then he knelt on the ground beside the sill and i could see by his face upturned in the moonlight showing his closed eyes and moving lips that he was praying up to that moment i had been curious to know what was in that package but after what i saw then i never thought of it without wanting to utter a small prayer myself though i never could decide what would be the appropriate thing to say seeing i knew none of the circumstances i am very particular not to give recommendations except where i am very sure the person i recommend is all right well markson disappeared a moment or two after first carefully replacing the sill and carrying away the chips and i got out of my tree forgetting all about the view i had discovered and the unexpected scene i had looked at ran in my mind so constantly that during the night i dreamed that markson stood in the hemlock tree with a gigantic brace and bit and bored holes in the hills beside the river while i kneeled in the second-story window frame and kissed my contract with markson and prayed that i might make a hundred thousand dollars out of it it is perfectly astonishing what things a sensible man will sometimes dream next morning i arrived at the building a few minutes before seven and found markson there before me he expressed himself satisfied with everything and paid me then and there a thousand dollars which was due on acceptance of the work as far as then completed he hung around all day while we put up the post and studying probably to see that the sill was not turned over and his secret disclosed and it was with this idea that i set the studying first on his particular sill by night we had the frame so near up that there was no possibility of the sill being moved and then markson went away he came up often after that to see how his house was getting along each time he came he would saunter around to that particular sill and when i noticed that he did this i made some excuse to call the men away from that side of the house sometimes he brought his family with him and i scarcely knew whether to be glad or sorry for while his daughter a handsome strong bright honest golden-haired girl of fifteen or sixteen always affected me as if she was a streak of sunshine and made me hope i should some day have a daughter like her his wife always affected me unpleasantly i am not a good physiognomist but i notice most people resemble animals of some sort and when i decide on what animal it is in any particular case i judge the person accordingly now mrs markson who was evidently her husband's second wife for she was too young to be helen's mother was rather handsome and extremely elegant but neither manners nor dress could hide a certain tigerish expression which was always in her face it was generally inactive but it was never absent and the rapidity with which it awoke once or twice when she disapproved something which was done or said made me understand why mr markson who always seemed pleasant and genial with any one else was quite silent and guarded when his wife was with him 
pretty soon the people of bartley knew all about the marksons how people learn all about other people is more than i can explain i never have a chance to know all about my neighbors for i am kept busy in looking to myself but if all the energy that is devoted to other people's business in bartley were expended on house-building trade would soon be so dull that i should be longing for a mansion in the skies everybody in bartley knew that helen markson's mother who was very beautiful and lovable had died years before and that her stepmother had been mrs markson only two or three years that the second mrs markson had married for money and that her husband was afraid of her and would run away from her if it wasn't for helen that mrs markson sometimes got angry and then she raved like mad and that it was wearing mr markson's life away for he was a tender-hearted man in spite of his smartness some even declared that markson had willed her all his property and insured his life heavily for her besides and that if he died before helen was married helen would be a beggar but none of these things had anything to do with my contract i worked away and had good weather so i lost no time and at the end of five months i had finished the house been paid for it had paid my bills and made a clear two thousand dollars on the job i could have made a thousand more without any one being the wiser for it but i don't build houses in that way the public will greatly oblige me by cutting this out this money gave me a handsome business start and having had no serious losses nor any houses thrown back upon my hands for i always make it a point to do a little better than i promise so folks can't find fault i am now quite well off and building houses on my own account to sell while some of my competitors who started before i did have been through bankruptcy while some have been too poor to do even that a few years after building markson's house i went with a southern friend into a black walnut speculation we bought land in the southwest cut the timber got it to market and made a handsome profit i am glad to say this business took me away from home and kept me for months but as i was still without family ties i did not suffer much during my absence still the old village seemed to take on a kind of motherly air as the stage with me in it rattled into town and i was just dropping into a pleasant little reverie when a carriage which i recognized as markson's dashed down the road met us and stopped while the coachman shouted rains is foreman says the old man's coming home to-day he meant me reckon his head was purty level replied the stage driver tossing his head backward toward me mr raines said the coachman recognizing me mr markson is awful sick like to die any minute and he wants to see you right away wishes you wouldn't wait for anything what to make of it i didn't know and said so upon which the stage driver rather pettishly suggested that it wouldn't take long to find out if i got behind markson's team and as i agreed with him i changed conveyances and was soon at markson's house helen met me at the door and led me immediately to markson's chamber the distance from the door of his room to the side of his bed couldn't have been more than twenty feet yet in passing over it it seemed to me that i imagined at least fifty reasons why the sick man had sent for me but not one of the fifty was either sensible or satisfactory i was even foolish enough to imagine markson's conscience was troubled and that he was going to pay me some money which he justly owed me whereas he had paid me every cent according to contract we reached his bedside before i had determined what it could be helen took his hand and said father here is mr raines markson who was lying motionless with his face to the wall turned quickly over and grasped my hand and beckoned me closer i put my head down and he whispered i'm glad you come i want to ask you a favor a dying man's last request you're an honest man n b people intending to build will please take note of this j r i am sure and i want you to help me do justice you have seen my wife she can be a tiger when she wants to she married me for money she thinks the will i made some time ago leaving everything to her is my last 
but it is not i've deceived her for the sake of peace i made one sense leaving the bulk of my property to helen it came to me through her dear mother i know nobody to trust it with mrs markson can wrap almost any one around her finger when she tries and his breath began to fail and the entrance of his wife did not seem to strengthen him any but he finally regained it and continued she will try it with you but you are cool as well as honest i believe i meant to tell helen where the will was the day after i put it there but she was so young it seemed dreadful to let her know how cowardly her father was how he feared her get it get a good lawyer see she has her rights i put it no one could suspect where i put it in the his breath failed him entirely and he fixed his eyes on mine with an agonized expression which makes me shiver whenever i think of it suddenly his strange operation with that sill of which i had not thought for a long time came into my mind and i whispered quickly in the sill of the house his expression instantly changed to a very happy one and yet he looked wonderstruck which was natural enough i saw you put it there said i but i continued fearing the dying man might suspect me of spying and so fear he had mistaken my character but i did not mean to i was on the ground when you came there that evening and when i saw what you were doing i could not move for fear of disturbing you i know where to find it and i can swear you put it there markson closed his eyes and never opened them again and his last act before going out of the world was to give my hand a squeeze which under the circumstances i could not help believing was an honest one as his hand relaxed i felt that i had better give place to those who had a right to it so i quietly retired helen fell on her knees by his bedside but mrs markson followed me out of the room mr raines said she with a very pleasant smile for a woman widowed but a moment before what did my dear husband want now i am an honest man and a church member and i was one then and believed in truth and straightforwardness just as much as i do now but somehow when such a person speaks to me i feel as if i were all of a sudden a velvet pawed cat myself so i answered with the straightest of faces only to see to one of the sills of the house ma'am and he made me solemnly swear to do it right away he was an extraordinary man ma'am to think of the good of his family up to the last moment ah yes dear man said she with a sigh which her face plainly showed came from nowhere deeper than her lips i hope it won't take long though she continued for i can't endure noise in the house not more than an hour i replied oh i'm so glad to hear it said she perhaps then you might do it while we were at the funeral day after to-morrow we will be gone at least two hours easily ma'am said i with my heart in my mouth at the idea of managing the matter so soon and having the papers for helen as soon as in any sort of decency mrs markson would be likely to have the old will read for the rest of the day i was so absent-minded to everything except this business of markson's that my acquaintances remarked that considering how long i had been gone i didn't seem very glad to see any one finally i went to old judge bardlow who was as true as steel and told him the whole story and he advised me to get the papers and give them to him to examine so on the day of the funeral i entered the house with a mallet and a mortising chisel and within fifteen minutes i had in my pocket the package markson had put in the sill years before and was hurrying to the judge's office he informed me that mrs markson's lawyer from the city had called on him that very morning and invited him to be present at the reading of the will in the afternoon so he would be able to put things in proper shape at once i was more nervous all that day than i ever was in waiting to hear from an estimate it was none of my business to be sure but i longed to see mrs markson punished for the mischief which i and every one else believed she had done her husband and i longed to see helen whom every one liked triumph over her stepmother who still young and gay was awfully jealous of helen's beauty and general attractiveness 
finally the long day wore away and an hour or two after the carriages returned from the funeral the city lawyer called the judge and at the judge's suggestion they both called for me we found mrs markson and helen with some of mrs markson's relatives helen had not one in the world in the parlor mrs markson looking extremely pretty in her neat fitting suit of black and helen looking extremely disconsolate the judge in a courtly old-fashioned way but with a good deal of heart for all that expressed his sympathy for helen and i tried to say a kind word to her myself to be sure it was all praise of her father whom i really respected very highly aside from my having had my first contract from him but she was large-hearted enough to like it all the better for that i was still speaking to her when mrs markson's lawyer announced that he would read the last will and testament of the deceased so when he sat down on a sofa i took a seat beside her the document was very brief he left helen the interest of twenty thousand dollars a year the same to cease if she married all the rest of the property he left to his wife as the lawyer concluded helen's face put on an expression of wonder and grief succeeded by one of utter loneliness while from mrs markson's eyes there flashed an exultant look that had so much of malignity in it that it made me understand the nature of satan a great deal more clearly than any sermon ever made me do poor helen tried to meet it with fearlessness and dignity but she seemed to feel as if even her father had abandoned her and she dropped her head and burst into tears i know it wasn't the thing to do before company but i took her hand and called her a poor girl and begged her to keep a good heart and trust that her father loved her truly and that her wrongs would be righted at the proper time being kind to my fellow-creatures is the biggest part of my religion for it's the part of religion i understand best but even if i had been a heathen i couldn't have helped wishing well to a noble handsome woman like helen markson i tried to speak in a very low tone but mrs markson seemed to understand what i said for she favoured me with a look more malevolent than any i had ever received from my most impecunious debtor the natural effect was to wake up all the old adam there was in me and to make me long for what was coming may i ask the date of that will asked judge bardlow certainly sir replied mrs markson's lawyer handing the document to the judge the judge looked at the date handed the will back to the lawyer and drew from his pocket an envelope here is a will made by mr markson said the judge and dated three months later mrs markson started her eyes flashed with a sort of fire which i hope i may never see again and she caught her lower lip up between her teeth the judge read the document as calmly as if it had been a mere supervisor's notice whereas it was different to the first will in every respect for it gave to helen all of his property of every description on condition that she paid to mrs markson yearly the interest of twenty thousand dollars until death or marriage this being the amount as the will said that she assured me would be amply sufficient for my daughter under like circumstances as the judge ceased reading and folded the document mrs markson sprang at him as if she were a wild beast give it to me she screamed hissed rather tis a vile hateful forgery madam said the judge hastily putting the will in his pocket and taking off his glasses that is a matter which the law wisely provides shall not be decided by interested parties when i present it for probate i'll break it interrupted mrs markson glaring as my family cat does when a mouse is too quick for her mrs markson's lawyer asked permission to look at the newer will which the judge granted he looked carefully at the signature of markson and the witnesses and returned the document with a sigh don't attempt it madam no use said he i know all the signatures seen them a hundred times i'm sorry very affects my pocket some for it cuts some of my prospective fees but that will can't be broken mrs markson turned looked at helen a second and then dashed at her as if to scatter tear and slay as the old funeral hymn says 
helen stumbled and cowered a little toward me seeing which i how on earth i came to do it i don't know put my arm around her and looked indignantly at mrs markson you treacherous hussy said mrs markson stamping her foot you scheming little minx i could kill you i could tear you to pieces i could drink your very heart's blood i could what else she could do she was prevented from telling for she fell into a fit and was carried out rigid and foaming at the mouth i am generally sorry to see even wicked people suffer but i wasn't a bit sorry to see mrs markson for while she was talking poor helen trembled so violently that it seemed to me she would be scared to death if her cruel stepmother talked much longer two hours later mrs markson with all her relatives and personal effects left the house and six months afterward mrs markson entrapped some other rich man into marrying her she never tried to break marston's will as helen was utterly ignorant of the existence of this new will until she heard it read the judge explained to her where it came from and as she was naturally anxious for all the particulars of its discovery the judge sent me to her to tell her the whole story so i dressed myself and drove down for though still under thirty i was well off and drove my own span and told her of my interview with her father on his deathbed as well as of the scene on the night he hid the will as i told her the latter part of the story a reverent loving self-forgetful look came into her face and made her seem to me like an angel as for myself the recalling of the incident now that i knew its sequel prevented my keeping my eyes dry i felt a little ashamed of myself and hurried away but her look while i spoke of her father and her trembling form in my arms while mrs markson raved at her were constantly in my mind and muddled a great many important estimates they finally troubled me so that i drove down again and had a long and serious talk with helen what we said though perfectly proper and sensible might not be interesting in print so i omit it i will say however that my longing when i first saw helen as a little girl for a daughter just like her has been fulfilled so exactly that i have named her helen markson rains after her mother and if she is not as much comfort to me as i suppose she would be it is no fault of hers but rather because the love of her mother makes me twenty years after the incidents of this story occurred so constantly happy that i need the affection of no one else End of story fourteen.